Okay, well, we're going to continue on with this uh, panel and the criminalization of poverty and protest. I'm Rachel West with the US Prostitutes Collective, and I'm going to be sharing the chairing with Sarah. Uh, yes, I'm from Women of Color in the Global Women's Strike and based in the UK. And we just wanted to welcome anyone who's joined us um, just after the morning. And it was fantastic. And we look forward to more along the same lines of this exciting program. So we'll go straight to our first speaker. And that is Margaret Robinson, who's from the Germantown Participatory Defense Hub in Philadelphia. Thank you. As you just heard, my name is Margaret Robertson, and uh, we're located about 20 minutes from here. Um, we've been meeting on Zoom since uh, COVID, but I'd like to give you a little idea of what participatory hubs do. Participatory defense started about 20 years ago in uh, San Jose, California. And it began as a group of workers who were working in Silicon Valley who felt that they needed help with the labor conditions. And they found as the conditions in the community changed, they were being policed in a different way. So it began as a um, labor issue, but they found that gentrification changed the way they were being policed and they began to share information with one another about what happened and, and, and ways they could help one another. Our situation in Philadelphia is very different. We have support from the um, defense community, um, the public defenders, they didn't have it. So they almost had to bogart their way into the courts. When community starts to help one another, share information, the courts are not necessarily greeting them with open arms, even defense attorney. Um, we started in about 2015 in Norristown. The um, chief defender in Norristown, Kier Bradford Gray, was then working in Montgomery County, and that's about I guess 25 miles or less away from, from Philadelphia. And uh, she started because she was introduced to participatory defense. She heard the speaker from California. She, she uh, invited him to Pennsylvania. They started it in 2015 in Montgomery County. And then in 2018, it came to Philadelphia because she transferred to Philadelphia and, and brought the same concept. We work with people who have criminal cases. They call us up and they say, I, I, I need some help. The first step is to say, where are you? Sometimes people don't understand what's going on. We try to introduce them to the stages of a criminal case. Then the next thing we do is to help them prepare an alternative view of themselves, because all you hear in the criminal case is your record or the charges against you. So we say, get get support from your community, from your family, get letters. Uh, for young people, they often don't have anyone uh, except maybe family members writing letters. So we would uh, get video. And these are maybe 10, 15 minute videos with people talking about who they are and what they mean to them. So you have an alternative to the, this criminal who's harming the community, um, which is not to say that sometimes people aren't guilty of the charges against them, but we're saying consider the whole person. The third thing we do is to go to court so that people are not appearing alone. It makes a huge difference when you have a 17 year old coming in alone. And I've been in at least one meeting where a parent of a 15 year old said, I can't go, this is just too much for me. You can't do that. You have to have somebody come in, even if it's too much for this young, often traumatized parent. The uh, new thing which we began to do is to um, have something called pre-entry. And that started um, in 2019, the idea of saying, what is the problem? Let's approach the problem even before you get to court or before you get to a, a, the part where the judge is actually looking at maybe sentencing you or deciding what to do with your case. That means 
we identify the problems. Okay, lack of education, uh, lack of employment, uh, the need for treatment in some psychological or um, emotional manner, uh, drug, perhaps drug treatment. And we try to address it before you get to court. So the court just doesn't think, okay, I, I have to intervene because this person's out of control and nothing's happening here. Um, about two years ago, though, I had a call from someone who had a criminal case and also had a dependency case. Most hubs are not involved in that, but a couple were. Uh, I'd say right now, may, maybe there are about two, possibly three hubs. There are seven here in Philadelphia. We are unusual. Most cities only have one, but we have seven. And um, when in this case, the parent was charged uh, criminally with the abuse of the child, we had another case where a parent was charged with neglect. And they also had dependency cases along with criminal cases. So in that, that's, that was my introduction to um, dependency cases. And we found it is a whole new world and it's very different from criminal cases because the standards and requirements for criminal criminal process the criminal process is somewhat murky but at least there's some ideas of what of what's going on this is completely obscure and um i i'm sorry it's neglect or abuse and it's in family court and um, as I said, we were primarily working in criminal courts, but um, it's been really hard to penetrate this. I really appreciated the booklet from the court, the family, or what do you call it, child court in Los Angeles, because we don't have anything like that for parents, and, and they are just wandering in the dark. One of the things that I, I think we have in common is that defense attorneys or the family the attorney who's representing the parent goes so far and no farther and then you find yourself well, where are you you know you're the lawyers just kind of step back and you're on your own don't advocate too strongly because there's a punishment for that don't ask too many questions there's definitely a punishment for that and be very careful how you talk to your children because there's always someone listening and they don't let, like you to ask questions like how are you doing what's going on mm -mm -mm. and and it's horrifying and um so i'm i'm finding so many similarities and such a strong need for intervention thank you okay thank you very much margaret okay our next speaker is campus Carney. Uh, Lisa Longstaff from Women Against Rape. <clears throat> Hi. Um, so we, we started in 1976, and our first 15 years we campaigned to get rape and marriage recognized as a crime, which we won in 1991. <clears throat> this gathering demands end women's poverty, absolutely. Money is our power to refuse sexual violence and our power to escape and recover. We've been multiracial since day one and always included sex workers and queer women and many other sectors of women. We work closely with women of color in the Global Women's Strike and All Africa Women's Group and as, as part of the Global Women Against Deportations. And as you've heard this morning, we're active in support not separation against the unwarranted separation of children from their loving mothers, often because of domestic violence. We have a new active, I'm sorry, our colleagues, some of our colleagues are not able to come today, um, who, are, who are hopefully online in the UK. And I wanna give a shout out to a, a newer member of our organization who is a young black Muslim woman, a daughter of African immigrants. 
and just to say, you know, what a richness that brings to our organization. We have, as, work, as we've worked with the Global Women's Strike for many years, we've always campaigned for money, including compensation for rape from the state. It's our money and they have to pay. It's an official acknowledgement of crimes we've suffered when the law has let us down big time. I want to speak a little bit about what's been happening with the police in the UK. Since in March 2021, a police officer abducted, raped and murdered a young woman who was walking home. Another officer raped and tortured 13 or more women, including other officers. Two officers were jailed after sharing selfies, which they took with the bodies of two murdered women of color who were killed by a stranger. Four young gay men were murdered by a serial killer and the police assumed they were accidental deaths, so they didn't investigate. In each case, the police didn't hardly do anything. So the survivors and the bereaved families assumed, sorry, the survivors and bereaved families campaigned publicly for investigations and prosecutions. People have been outraged. Instead of responding to people's outrage, the government has given the police even more power especially to criminalize protesters. We've seen obscene state repression and obscene disregard for our lives. Thousands, especially women, have been protesting publicly in the streets and in every other sphere against rape and other violence, including by police, against racist murders, against police corruption, and for and against the climate crisis and a whole host of other things. And this has been the response of the government is to give them more powers in a number of um, parliamentary acts. When the second officer was exposed publicly, he was convicted and we went to his trial to have a protest outside, sorry, not the trial, the sentencing at the end of the trial, to have a protest outside the court we went there to get publicity and we got loads of publicity, which was really great. We were on the TV, we were in papers all over the UK and we even got in the New York Times and a newspaper in Australia. At that protest, not only Women Against Rape members, but all the groups and sectors of the strike spoke out there and everyone cussed out the police from our own sector's experiences. Women, including women with disabilities, have been complaining about police racism and everything else. Not only black women have been complaining about racism. And that's new in some ways, that we feel the Black Lives Matter movement had a big impact. And it's been shocking, but also good that all these police are being exposed now because this has gone on for years. And it's now made it easier for us to raise rape and racism, including Islamophobia of the police. The media used to balk at it when we spoke about it and they wouldn't print it, but not now. They print the public outrage. The movement has forced the government to sack a number of senior officers, including uh, a prominent woman. And official reports found police institutionally racist, sexist, homophobic, and corrupt, and that they've been enabling and even committing rape and murder. And at the same time, they've decriminalized rape. The conviction rate in the UK is currently only about 1% of reported cases, let alone all those that didn't report, which is the majority. Now, Women Against Rape has been protesting police rape and racism for decades. Now it's undeniable. Every few days, another officer is being charged or convicted of sexual abuse of power 
or of or other or kinds of appalling racism about bloody time. They also have to stop prosecuting women for making so-called false reports of rape, often to cover up their own negligent investigations. And they have to stop taking children from loving mums, suffering domestic violence, and giving them to abusive fathers and institutions. We're making a big experience together. We're building our forces against state criminalization of protest and of poverty. And we're determined to win justice, compensation, and asylum. Thank you very much, Lisa. Our next speaker is Charles Hector from the human, a human rights lawyer from Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, I would prefer just a human rights defender. The topic that I was given was end the criminalization of poverty and protest. It was complex. Okay. So the question is that why is the poor and protest feared? By whom and why? That, that, is the, that is the fundamental question kind of things. The poor, which is the majority of the masses kind of things, it's best to keep them separated and distracted. You know? So they don't actually come together and chase after the authorities or the people who want to suppress them. Okay. Now, Despite that kind of things, when you see people coming together, one example which I want to talk about is in August 2010, a Nepali worker died in, in his workplace. The reason he died was because he was, the employer failed to send him to the hospital in time. That was the reason. There was no transport to take him. Then 5,000 migrant workers, non-unionized, it's not a trade union, so it's a totally illegal action kind of things. They came out and protested for three days. Of course, newspapers called it riot, troublemakers, and all these kind of things. But at the end of the day, they won. The company finally agreed to provide a vehicle and driver on a 24-hour standby at the main hostel to facilitate emergency transportation of worker to hospital for an emergency. So when people come together and act, they can win. Now, the, the, the worry is that the poor, when vacant, is powerful. So the thing is, uh, what we must do to the poor, that means the people in power are doing certain things to the poor and the masses. One of the things is to prevent them from coming together, uh, discussing. Because in Malaysia, for example, you know, uh, when, when more than three, previously, when more than three people gather together, even if it's in a meeting in this kind of a center, it's illegal. You need to get a police permit. So therefore, it makes it very difficult for people to come together and organize. And people don't talk to each other or don't discuss how can they plan and act. So that is, that is important. So in terms of that thing. So the idea is to keep them all ignorant. Keep the masses, keep the poor ignorant, keep them like a frog under the coconut shell. Ah, the slides, oh sorry, I thought you was. Uh, this is uh, slide number six. Okay, and then also, also the other thing that they actually, slide six. And the, the other thing is that the big brother is watching you. Always give the impression that the police and the authorities are actually watching you. So keep them scared. And we are watching your internet. We are watching your communication. We are watching this thing. So therefore, do nothing. Be good boy. Be good girl. That is it. And then the other thing that they try to sell is without me, you can do nothing. Who is selling this? It's sometimes not the government itself. It's sometimes even our congressmen, our members of parliament, our people's representative. They don't want to empower people to act together. They'll say, don't worry, I will take care of it. So it's the process is actually creating this whole culture of dependency. Okay. So that, that's it in terms of uh, prevent association, prevent discussion. Next slide. Uh, slide seven. Okay. And 
prevent collective action because that collective action, the strongest collective action is protest. People coming out and actually showing that action. One of the this thing is very strong. <clears throat> okay, uh, the next slide. Okay, in terms of uh, the poor, the poor is basically discriminated by the law. The poor is discriminated by the law enforcement. The poor is actually discriminated by the whole criminal administration of justice. If, I don't know, in, in Malaysia, which we follow the common law system kind of things, on uh, every day at the magistrate's court, people are brought in to be charged and to plead guilty, not guilty for remand applications. If you go to the magistrate's court in, in, in Malaysia, for example, and sit down, you find that certain people are not there. You don't find any of this middle class or these rich people. Even certain ethnic groups are this thing. So there's a certain category of people that are actually being judged and every day, you know. So what happened to the rest? Was it corruption? Was it something else? Or it was, this, was the law enforcement being preferential in who they actually enforce the law against? Now, in terms of uh, in prisons, Sam raised this point earlier. In Malaysia in 2017, 29 0.8% of the people in prison, that was translated to about 17,663, are pre-trial remand prisoners. Meaning they, they have not yet been convicted. They have not yet serving their sentence and they are stuck in prison. Why is this? And the only reason is simple, poverty. Because they can't furnish bail. If you are a rich man, you can put your bail money and you're walking around and continuing your life, staying with your family and whatsoever. So that, that again, you, you see that it's there. And because of this phenomena, and you don't know when your trial, if it's your small trial kind of things, it's going to be postponed, postponed, postponed. Some people, when the trial date comes up, they have actually served the maximum sentence before being convicted or whatever. So therefore, the response of the poor in, in, in a lot of the prison systems kind of things is that they plead guilty, although they are innocent. Why plead guilty? Because there is certainty of when I come out. I know I have to serve three-month sentence or six-month sentence, then I am free. So that is there. Now, in terms of, uh, even in terms of when, when, when workers are acting, this is an interesting story. Workers conducting a legal picket. Eleven of them were arrested. For what? Making excessive noise and charged in court. <laughs> so this, this is a legal picket, no? According to the law, they can picket at, at the particular location and they were charged for making excessive noise. Now in Malaysia, as, as I pointed out earlier, the law previously was that more than three gathering is illegal. It's unlawful. It's an illegal assembly. Then they came up with this Peaceful Assembly Act in 2012. Nice sounding law. But the problem was that now to protest, you have to give uh, 10 days notice. Now reduced to five days notice to the police. You have to go and get the permission of the place where you're going to protest. If it's a public space, means you have to go and get from the local public authority. And would they give permission not to protest in this particular strategic location? No. So it becomes more this thing. The lawyers actually, the Malaysian bar actually protested the tabling of the bill and the passing of the bill. It came out in, uh, in large numbers, about 2,000 of us came out before the bill was passed. Uh, okay. Then, now, the bill has been passed. And the problem with the bill is that it gives the police powers. with no more right. It becomes a permission. Police are permission givers and they can decide. So in terms of even recently, uh, when fishermen went for protest, 4,000 of them affected and they wanted to protest. Police told them, oh, only 1,000 people. So that's it. So, but despite now, in terms of this thing of, of recent times, there's been more problems. Even those who follow the law, give the permissions, give all, satisfy everything, so on and so forth, they are being targeted. Women's March 2023. They had a Women's March in, in KL, but at the midnight of the same day after the march, suddenly the, the police is at the house and giving notices to about 
seven of the organizers and the participants in the middle of the night of the same day. Why? I said, asking them to turn up in the police station for investigation. Why middle of the night on the same day of the march? Couldn't you have done it the following day in the morning or something? So even in terms of for lawyers, sir, in uh, the previous leave, we had no problem. Our recent protest kind of things, which we had assembled to walk to parliament again. When we all assembled and we were about to walk to parliament, suddenly the police comes there and they put up their barriers and they hand lock us around kind of things so that we can't move out or we can't move in. And they said, no, you cannot walk to parliament. So the thing is, even if you follow the law, this is becoming a problem. Okay. And uh, so the thing is, this attack on protest itself is actually also this, also the, 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 the problem that is thing. They just don't want people to meet. They just don't want people to gather. They just don't want people to this thing. Even associations, you've got a lot of different groups here, you know, which is not a problem. But in Malaysia, if you have a group, you have to register it. You have to have seven people and you have to register it. When you try to register it, you might not get registration. Our organizations kind of things, we consider ourselves a non juridical organization because we don't want to register ourselves. Your group recently tried a anti death penalty. They said they cannot put in the word death penalty or anti death penalty. They're not going to register such organizations. So basically, that the uh, free and fair election coalition was declared unlawful. Even though they, they haven't even yet registered, but they were declared unlawful. One, once you're declared unlawful, you're anybody participating in any, acti any activity kind of things. So the fear is people getting together, association, and the next fear is protest. So that is the thing. So that is basically, I think, so some of the things that I can touch within the five minutes I've been given. Anything more and much, much more, you can talk to me later. Okay. okay, so the next speaker, Susan Burton, right? Is it online? Yeah, Susan Burton from A New Way of Life in Los Angeles. Going to be online. There is a connection between uh, poverty and criminalization. And I would, I would go so far as to say that poverty is criminalized. Um, we have so many uh, uh, law enforcement officers going coming through our neighborhoods and it's almost as if they're hunting for people. Uh, I call it the hunt in the concrete jungle. Uh, and people are arrested for minute things, things uh, such as a warrant for a traffic ticket to shoplifting and um, maybe even passing the check that they don't have money in the bank for. And um, instead of we as a country getting to the root of the problem this person has, we lock them up, we chain them up, we put them in cages, and we punish them and exploit their labor. And so, you know, if it was a uh, 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 other places that I saw, you know, things just not handled, infractions not handled that way, petty thefts not handled that way, uh, addictions not handled that way, and it's it's a it's a shame. Uh, and I would always I'll say it's it's like those acts are criminal. Uh, in my thought. Um, and um, since they launched a war on drugs, the whole number of women have con increased 800% um, in incarceration. So the war on drugs actually just blew up, exploded the mass incarceration of women. And when women leave our community, the healer leaves. The homemaker leaves. The one who puts the, the band-aids on the children leaves. The one who sings 
uh, nighttime carols or reads books at night, they leave. The homemaker leaves. The grounder of the family is caged up, punished. Uh, uh, and in the case of the war on drugs, their, their addictions are criminalized and they're punished. They're not treated. And we all know that the war on drugs was our government's um, way of funding a war on the backs of black poor neighborhoods. Uh, and then I won't say, I won't leave out brown people also. And we are, you know, in really high numbers per capita in the prison system experience. So what I just described with the war on drugs is my personal experience. Um, I had a, I had, I had a really tough life from uh, childhood up until adulthood, but I hung on and I navigated it. And uh, up until the point that my five-year-old son was killed by an LAPD detective. And at that point, our community had gotten saturated with drugs. Uh, I meditated my, my, my grief with the drugs and I was criminalized. Uh, and, and, and it's, and it's, and it's really, really ironic. So when we have an opioid explosion, it's a, it's a medical problem. It's a health problem. When they put all of the crack in our neighborhoods, it was a criminal problem. And I was criminalized and I was shipped off to prison. I was caged. I was bought out of my cage to work for eight cents an hour. If I did not work for eight cents an hour, another day was added onto my sentence. Uh, uh, thankfully, I found help. I found help in Santa Monica where they did not criminalize those folks who were white and wealthy. Um, they sent them to drug courts. They sent them to community service. Uh, they sent them to uh, treatment. They gave them papers to get signed. And when I got out there, I thought, wasn't my life worth a piece of paper? And I founded a new way of life reentry project that provides housing and support for other women. And what I'm doing now is I am replicating our model all over the world. Um, I'm helping people to build homes and build a, a, a reentry movement that when women leave prison, they have somewhere to go. Because after all the criminalization, after all the money that they spend on incarceration and punishment, when your sentence is over, they boot you out the door and you face a lifetime of barriers, no support whatsoever. I mean, it's outrageous what we do. I want to say, I wish I could be there with you today, uh, but I am opening houses on the day of your conference. And uh, that's my life mission, to create pathways to freedom, safety for women, and opportunity for their potential to sell. But I stay grounded because, you know, I can never forget, I can never forget where I've come from. I can never forget that where I have came from, other people are coming behind me, but I will never forget how harmful and how people People just tried to crush me like a roach. I will never forget what it feels like to walk out of a prison door and after being abused so badly and have nowhere to go. I'm not looking for fame. You know, I'm not looking for fortune. I'm looking for change. And I'm going to make it go. Um, so we'll go on to the next speaker, who is Michael Kalmanovitz from the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network in the UK.
Hi, thank you very much. Okay, so IJAN, which is short for International Jewish Anti Zionist Network, is committed to struggles for human survival, of which the Palestinian struggle is an absolutely indispensable part. Zionism always was and continues to be a racist and imperialist endeavor. Israel has become a role model for right-wing, nationalist, repressive states around the world. Modi's India, Orban's Hungary, Bolsonaro's Brazil, and of course, Trump's America. Israel arms and repress, uh, repression industries have been, as they say, battle-tested on Palestinian people. Israel then sold its arms to apartheid South Africa, Central, Central American death squads, the Rwandan genocide, the Argentinian dirty war, 30,000 people disappeared, a disproportionate number of whom were Jewish. You understand that Israel was arming the junta as it was killing Jewish people. And of course, Israel helped arm Haiti's repression. So Ijan wrote this pamphlet, Israel's worldwide role in repression, about 10 years ago, which expresses much of that. We now need to update it. Now it must show that Israel has been arming the Ukrainian Nazi battalions for many years and armed Myanmar to commit genocide against the Muslim minority Rohingya people. We need some help updating this, so if anybody's ready to help, we'd love you to. I wanted to say something about the refuseniks in Israel. So there is a Jewish opposition to this militarism. Hundreds of young Israelis and thousands of reservists are res refusing to serve in the army. Palestine Action, led by a young, Palestin a young Palestinian woman in the UK, has occupied, painted red, and bust up machinery in Israeli arms factories in the UK. They have largely avoided court, but now the UK courts are stopping them making a political case that they are committing a smaller crime in order to prevent a bigger one. Their protest is being criminalized, as of many other protests in the UK. And now the Tories are trying to present an anti-boycott law in the UK and the Labour Party under Starmer has, you wouldn't believe this, expelled more Jewish people than any other leader of the Labour Party. You are five times more likely as a Jewish person to be accused of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party than if you're not Jewish. And we've been victims of that. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention the Stop the JNF campaign. IJAN has been, it was the, one of the founding organizations. The JNF is the Jewish National Fund. But its job over the last hundred years has been, well, certainly now, anyhow, is to steal land and water from Palestinian people. It plants non-indigenous trees, the kind that destroys the soil, and steals or destroys native trees and plants, including over a million olive trees. The JNF has planted an American park, a British park, even a Coretta King forest over Palestinian villages in order to prevent Palestinian people from returning home. Ah, okay. To cap it all, only Jewish people can live and work on JNF land. So if you wanted to know about apartheid in Israel, this 
is a key part. It's a charity. Can you believe it? It's a charity here and in the UK and in other places in the world. It's a charity that commits ethnic cleansing. Okay. So, um, yes. That'll do. Uh, check out the Stop the JNF campaign website for more. Finally, I want to speak about um, how Zionism is derailing the anti-racist movement. There's an organization called Stand Up to Racism in the UK. Every year in Glasgow, rabid Islamophobic right-wing Friends of Israel groups march with Stand Up to Racism. It's unbelievable. There's been letters, there have been protests, there's been petitions. Stand Up to Racism absolutely refuses to stop the racists on their so-called anti-racist march. It acts like a Zionist infiltrator in the anti-racist movement, and it must be happening in many other places. Finally, a lot is at stake. We are committed to fighting against Jewish supremacy. You hear the word supremacy, it's just another way of saying the master race. And we all know what that means. And we must stop that. And in order to do that, we must work across different movements. We must work with the anti-racist movement. We must work against pinkwashing with the lesbian and gay movement. We must work against the deportation of African asylum seekers in Israel with the anti-deportation movement, etc. And of course, the anti-militarization movement. Finally, I'll leave the last quote to the great Marek Edelman, who was one of the leaders of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. He said, to be a Jew, means always being with the oppressed and never the oppressors. Never the oppressors. Okay, free Palestine. Thank you, Michael. Okay, our last speaker is Nikki Adams from our sister organization, the English Collective of Prostitutes. Okay, how's that? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm speaking, I'm from the English Collective of Prostitutes and I'm speaking as the International Prostitutes Collective. Uh, we're an international network uh, with people in many countries, but we also have two sister organizations, as Rachel said, US Prostitutes Collective and Empower in Thailand. And Liz from Empower was going to be with us here at this gathering, but she sadly passed away and is sorely missed every day. So as a network, we are campaigning for decriminalization. That is to end the criminalization of sex work and to get money into women's hands is a very obvious connection. If we had, we're supportive, we're campaigning, part of the campaign for a care income, because if we had the money for the caring work that we do, which we know is very valuable to society, we wouldn't be pushed into prostitution in the first place, and we could leave if we want to. It was when Liz spoke in London in 2015 that we first heard of another organization describing sex workers as heads of households because we had campaigned for many, many decades to establish that sex workers are mainly mothers, mostly mothers, mostly single mothers who are pushed into prostitution because of poverty and hunger and homelessness. Um, so this gathering here is about ending poverty and whilst we don't glamorize or promote prostitution, you know, our first slogan was that we are for prostitutes and against prostitution 
but it's definitely true that sex work is a resistance to the grinding poverty that is imposed on us. And as one fantastic woman in our group said, we can stay in bed or live in squalor. We can live on bread and jam, but I deserve more and so does my daughter. I choose to go on the street and earn that money because I want a better life. I also, I was in a workshop a couple of years ago with some of the people here and I was thinking the connection with the panel that we heard this morning is that uh, a woman told a story about how a young mother, and she didn't have a push chair, I don't know what you call it here, a stroller, thank you, she didn't have a stroller for her child and the social worker told her, if you don't have a stroller for your child, by Monday morning, we're taking your child away. And I thought, that's the story of prostitution. What's the woman going to do? She's going to get the stroller by some means, by high, you know, high, you know, by some means, fundamentally. Empower also says that by the time we come to sex work, usually have we have done all the jobs available to women, to low-income women who are, as they say, without qualifications and capital. We're the farmers that can't make a living on the land. We've worked in factories. We've done domestic work. We're women fleeing persecution, war, and the climate crisis. And the fact is, is that for most working class women internationally, the choice we're often faced with is between destitution and prostitution. Sex workers are persecuted relentlessly in most countries of the world. In some places, the very act of exchanging sex for money is criminalized. In the UK, that isn't illegal, but everything you do in order to meet a client is uh, made is criminalized. So it's illegal to work on the street and to work together from premises, which is a scandal because obviously it's safer to work together with a mate. And the risk of arrest by working in isolation is massive. You get a criminal record that has lifetime consequences. It includes imprisonment, losing custody of your children, and Oh, losing your immigration status, you know, facing deportation for those of us who are immigrant. The only country in the world that has de decriminalized sex work is New Zealand. And it's been verifiably shown that it's improved health and safety for sex workers with among many other benefits. It's a model that can be followed. Migrant sex workers were excluded from that kind of pro protection at the time, and that's a battle that's still being fought out there. Things are changing very fast. Empower, after 36 years of campaigning, is on the cusp of winning decriminalization in Thailand. <laughs> Who was it that said, was it Mildred that said earlier that it was something that was seemingly impossible until it was possible? And it really is like that. Yeah. Um, so I was speaking to B earlier and we were thinking, or I was thinking of the kind of things that made a difference. You know, what are the kind of truths that you can draw from that many years of struggle that has won decriminalization? And the first thing is, is that Thailand had a revolution. People were out on the streets month after month after month after month, and they overthrew a military government. And obviously that makes decriminalization a lot easier. But the other thing is that uh, what stands in our way is the vested interests, whether that's the police that profit from prostitution and get to exercise their power, or it's the people that want to side with the forces of law and order, that want to be with the state or who are the state, that have an interest in keeping prostitution criminalized. We have suffered from our struggles being seen as separate. Lisa spoke about the way in which the police have been widely, widely discredited, have been shown to be misogynistic and racist and criminally corrupt. And yet we're still 
told that when it comes to sex workers, they're our saviors, that they can do welfare visits with our interests in mind. And that has really started to change. And it also was massively helped by the Black Lives Matter movement, because when that outpouring came about, when then sex workers were saying, look, this is the treatment we too have been receiving, and we've been speaking about it for decades, people started to listen in a different kind of way. In the US, there's been a wave of decriminalization, and we hope that it's unstoppable. Or the organizing has often been led by trans women of color, who, for example, one repeal of the loitering law in New York State, a law that was widely known as the walking while trans law. And it's a racist law. 91% of those arrested under the law were black and Latinx people, mostly women. The good thing about that campaign to repeal that law is that it was very principled. The organizers made clear that what they were campaigning for was full decriminalization, that nothing less would do. And they specifically said that we're not saying that we as trans women of color are being wrongly mistaken for sex, for sex workers. We're saying the whole law is bad and it must go. Us pros also, we'll hear probably later in the workshop, has won many victories, including compensation for sex workers and formerly incarcerated people who are victims of violence. In the UK, we've also won some things. We haven't had a revolution yet, so we're not on the cusp of winning decriminalization, but you never know. But we do win a lot of cases, getting prosecutions dropped, for example, when the police invaded central London uh, and closed down working women's flats where they were able to work together in more safe circumstances, we got those flats reopened. And together with Women Against Rape, we put a serial rapist behind bars. We recently won against a banning order in a very poor neighborhood of East London where they were literally going to fine, give on the spot fines to sex workers working there. And we defeated that against the council. The public and increasingly, obviously, very obviously young people are definitely on our side, pressing for decriminalization. The politicians are way behind, but the public is with us. They're scandalized that women who are working to earn a living to support their family should be persecuted and criminalized. The ones that oppose us are usually the ones, the ones that want to be the state or be with the state, including feminist politicians who side with the police against sex workers. They are also the ones that promote transphobia that has resulted in hundreds of anti-trans laws in the US and in many other countries. That has to change. We have to demand that feminism means ending women's poverty. That feminism means demanding a care income. And that both feminism and all movements for justice means siding with so-called bad women against bad laws. Can I just say how powerful that was? Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki and the whole panel. That was fantastic.